going to introduce our keynote uh, for this morning. It's wonderful for us to have Jeremy Epstein, who's the Assistant Director for Technologies and Privacy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Prior to joining OSTP, Jeremy led the National Science Foundation Secure and Trustworthy CyberSafe Program, also known as SATSE, which is the NSF's flagship program uh, for cybersecurity and privacy research funding with over a thousand active research projects. Uh, and one that's very important to us, uh, that program, uh, Jeremy's program at NSF, is the one that funded the Privacy Tools Project about 10 years ago uh, that got us here started on the path of both interdisciplinary research related to privacy and the transition of differential privacy from theory to practice. And Jeremy is a past chair of the ACM's U.S. Technology Policy Committee and founder of Scholarships for Women Studying Information Security enjoys bicycling and chocolate, and uh, regrets that he can't be here in person, but we're very delighted to have you on the screen, Jeremy. Looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much for the opportunity to join you today. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there as well. Um, uh, it, it's been interesting. I, I listened to some of the last few talks, and mine is as untechnical as the last few have been technical, and so I hope you'll forgive me for that, but uh, it is great to be here. Um, so privacy is a crucial uh, uh, technology as recognized by President Biden in the recent executive order that was in October on the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence, which notes the importance of privacy and privacy-enhancing technologies in protecting Americans' privacy and civil liberties. Um, at OSTP, we have a team of folks who are working to maximize the benefits of science and technology to advance health, prosperity, security, environmental quality, and justice for all. We carry out this mission by advising the president and White House senior staff on key issues relating to science and technology and by coordinating federal government technology policy and priorities. I've spent my career working in privacy and cybersecurity like the SATSE program uh, just mentioned. Uh, while I am a computer scientist by training, Throughout my career, I've collaborated with lawyers, policymakers, and social scientists who consider both the design and regulation of technical systems as essential to protecting democratic values and human rights, as well as our safety and security. And you heard that in the question I was asking Mayana. We can't just look at things from a technical perspective. So today I'm going to uh, do three, uh, I'd like to talk about three things in my time with you. I want to tell you a little bit about why I'm excited to be speaking with you at the Open DP workshop. Not that I mean, you you know why it's exciting, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the Biden Harris administration is doing to increase the use of privacy preserving technologies to protect our information. And uh, I want to emphasize the vital role that this community and academia more broadly, as, as well as industry, can play in shaping the future. So why I'm excited to be here is that as technologies evolve and develop, they often raise new challenges to our security and privacy, as well as to our commitments to equity and justice. To identify and mitigate the risk that these new technologies present, it's crucial to have scientific and technological experts participate in the conversation. But fully addressing these issues in government through legislation, regulation, policy development, and executive actions requires interdisciplinary experience and expertise. It requires lawyers, policy experts, <laughs> scientists, and technologists working together. This community, you in this room, and your colleagues and collaborators are focused on a lot of the cross-disciplinary scholarship um, that happens at the intersection of computer science and regulation. We wouldn't be talking about uh, open DP and differential privacy uh, if it weren't in part for because of regulation. You're focused on a broad set of topics ranging from security and privacy to usability, transparency, and fairness, and with an eye towards how computing technologies are impacting consumers. Um, while I started my career, uh, as I said, as a computer scientist, um, I've spent a lot of time working on policy and law and regulation. And at OSTP, I've gotten to work on these issues from inside government, which has given me a new appreciation for how academic research, like what you're talking about today, uh, can influence policy and the important role communities like this one uh, play in achieving a future gov where government at all levels can ensure that technology works for everyone. So let me tell you just a little bit about some of the things that the administration is doing 
uh, as technology becomes intertwined in our daily lives. So President Biden and all of us in the Biden-Harris administration are committed to using technology and data to support the public interest. As I said earlier, ensuring technology works for everyone. While you might not have read the executive orders and federal regulations word for word, uh, if you do, you'll see this commitment threaded through the administration's actions. And just as an aside, I'll note that I get a lot of things to read um, before they come out. So the other day I was given something and asked for comments from a privacy perspective. And I opened up the, the uh, it was a proposed regulation and I opened it up and it was uh, 583 pages of regulation. And I assure you, I did not read 583 pages of regulation considering I think I had two days in which to uh, submit comments. So I read the first 20 or 30 or 40 pages and then I did a lot of keyword searching uh, for the rest. So um, uh, I don't, if you haven't read uh, all the regulations and all of the executive orders, I understand. So on the uh, his first day in, in office, the president signed an executive order establishing a working group on equitable data focused on using data to evaluate and align federal programs and policies to ensure they're serving all Americans. In December of 2021, the president signed another executive order, this time directing the federal government to modernize and improve service delivery and specifically leveraging technology solutions to do that. And in May 2022, there was uh, an executive order directing the federal government to assess how data can inform equitable and effective policing, as well as identify privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties concerns relating to the use of technology, including facial recognition and predictive algorithms. This is only a sampling of some of the activities you're seeing in this administration to make sure technology works for all Americans. And as I've mentioned late last year, I think it was October, uh, President Biden signed the executive order on safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence. Um, it's clear that this wasn't, that that name was not written by a geek because it's not uh, an acronym that you can pronounce. The executive order directs the establishment of new standards for AI safety and security, protection of Americans' privacy, advancement of equity and civil rights, and advances American innovation leadership around the world. So you might ask, what does an executive order on AI have to do with privacy? The, the EO explains, and I'm just going to quote a small part of it, um, to combat the risk uh, from AI, the federal government will ensure that the collection, use, and retention of data is lawful, secure, mitigates privacy and confidentiality risks. Agencies shall use available policy and technical tools, including privacy-enhancing technologies where appropriate, to protect privacy and combat the broader legal and societal risks that result from the improper collection and use of people's data. So there are a lot of activities within the government relating to privacy, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them uh, briefly. Um, in spring of 2023, the White House released the National Strategy to Advance Privacy Preserving Data Sharing and Analytics Report. That's PPDSA, if, uh, for those of you who like acronyms. And this identified need identified areas needing further research. And consistent with that report and the AI executive order, earlier this summer, NSF announced the Privacy Preserving Data Sharing in Practice Program, lovingly referred to as PDAS, P-D-A-S-B. Um, it's a, the program is a joint initiative between government and industry, providing funding for research to privately share and analyze data for a range of use cases and applications. Government sponsors besides NSF include NIST and the Department of Transportation, and they're more under discussion. Private sector partners include Intel and VMware, and I think there are others under discussion there as well. Uh, the program includes $23 million in funding and is open to academics and small businesses, and the submission deadline for that is September 27th. I hope many of you will be submitting to that, except, uh, except uh, Mayana from Microsoft, who's not eligible. Uh, because she's not from a small company. Um, the second uh, thing I want to mention is that in 2022 and 2023, the US and UK governments jointly ran a, set, a series of privacy challenges to advance responsible innovation in pets. 
NIST and NSF in cooperation with OSTP. I was at NSF when this was happening. Um, managed the U.S. side of the competition. The targeted problems included financial crime prevention, pandemic response, and forecasting. And there was $1.6 million in cash prizes to winners from academia and industry. And following on from that competition, NIST created a series of blog posts on differential privacy and a series on privacy preserving federated learning and encourage you to read those. Third, over the past 18 months, a number of agencies have led an internal effort that I chair that has brought together uh, practitioners to explore use cases for pets technologies within the federal government. We've heard about technology that may be useful, including OpenDP, from people in this room and across academia and government. And uh, probably some of those of you who are presenting this week will hear from me uh, with invitations to come talk to the group as well. We also heard about a study in a European country that examined every part of government for how pets could be used to address their data sharing needs. It's a really cool study. Unfortunately, it hasn't been fully translated into English yet, but they basically went to every part of their government and said, how can you use pets to provide better privacy protection of data in your part of government? And, and um, they, they identified many, many uses. So it was really an interesting report. Again, I, unfortunately, it's not fully translated to English. So I've only seen the executive summary and the uh, um, slides so far. Uh, the fourth thing is NIST is building a pets test bed, um, initially focused on privacy preserving federated learning model environment. It aims to provide open source software like OpenDP to run locally and in a cloud environment to stimulate simulate uh, a central server connected to a set of data, data silos. The initial deployment of the environment focuses on genomic data and providing input and output privacy protections. Uh, participants in the NSF PDAS program that I mentioned a minute ago uh, are welcome to use the NIST software or potentially collaborate with NIST. Uh, this may include enhancing the PPML environment design and broadening its use, adding modular components to support its expansion, contributing benchmark data sets, uh, for different use cases beyond genomics and conducting privacy, security, efficiency, and accuracy research on existing resources. And the fifth uh, thing I'm going to mention uh, here is last year, NIST solicited comments on their 800-226 guidelines for evaluating differential private privacy guarantees. Uh, the standard, which will be released by the end of October, and I know that because it says that in the AI executive order, and I've received confirmation from NIST that they are on track, uh, is intended to help agencies and practitioners of all backgrounds, policymakers, business owners, product managers, IT technicians, software engineers, data scientists, researchers, and academics better understand how to evaluate promises made and not made when deploying differential privacy, including for privacy-preserving machine learning. So I, I've talked about a bunch of different things that are going on, but our ability to meet this moment depends on you. So this is sort of the, the, the last part that I wanna talk about because you're here primarily to talk about the technology, but I'm here to also say, we need people like you in this room. We can use the technology to benefit the public. We also need to take action to protect consumers and we need to get your service in government. There are a lot of different ways members of the community can get involved. There are, there are different paths for you. Um, many of you know the, um, excuse me, the former head of OSTP's technology team and the principal deputy US CTO, Deirdre Mulligan. She's a lawyer by training and she's collaborated with computer scientists throughout her career and worked with colleagues at a number of University of California campuses to review the electronic voting systems used in California for the California Secretary of State. That's how I got to know her. Um, and that assessment uh, led to multiple reforms. So she's been involved in privacy and in policy for a long time. Uh, some folks work in government. As you've heard, I've spent many years at NSF. I've spent a brief stint at DARPA um, and now at OSTP, helping to shape our nation's cybersecurity 
and privacy research and development portfolio. Uh, my former colleague, Alan Misloff, who just returned to Northeastern University uh, after service in OSTP as the deputy chief CTO, worked in many privacy related uh, areas. My former colleague, Dominique duval Diop uh, served as the chief data scientist of the United States and earlier in her career was a uh, AAAS fellow. She's a policy analyst, data scientist, and economic geographer working at the nexus of data tech and equity to help build the capacity of federal agencies uh, in, in some of these areas. Many of you already serve on public policy committees. Uh, maybe even a few of you uh, are part of USTPC that I formerly headed. Uh, these committees are an important institutional level mechanism that supports professionals who want to contribute to public service. The volunteers and staff who write policy recommendations reflecting technical expert advice, unbiased by business considerations, provide a crucial public service. I read the comments that come from these groups uh, in, in response to government RFIs, and they influence uh, government action. Uh, these roles also pique it, pop folks' interest in public service serving as gateways. For example, Ed Felton, whom many of you know from Princeton, was chair of ACM's uh, Public Policy Committee before he came to OSTP as Deputy Chief Technology Officer. So what can we do to get you involved? Um, a key element of the AI executive order is an AI talent surge to bring experts from AI and AI enabling fields into government. And we're also looking at expanding that to other STEM fields as well. We're doing everything we can to ease the path into public service. And you can look at ai.gov slash apply if you're interested in AI in particular. The Office of Personnel Management is making it easier for agencies to quickly hire technical talent, such as data scientists. Things from the Obama-Biden administration, like the Presidential Innovation Fellowship and the U.S. Digital Service, continue to bring technical talent into the federal government. Programs launched in the Biden-Harris administration, such as U.S. Digital Corps, are bringing on early career technologists, something that may be of particular interest to the Open DP community. And there are external fellowships that place technologists in federal agencies and the halls of Congress, things like uh, IEEE, uh, Congressional Fellows, and Tech Congress. Additionally, with the unprecedented investments coming into American communities through the Investing in America agenda, now is a great time for public, public interest technologists to serve in state and local governments and local nonprofits to help those who need it the most. We're looking for people with a mix of technical and policy expertise, whether it's AI, privacy, et cetera. We need technologists, social scientists, lawyers, and ethicists, among others. So there was an event OSTP organized last month that included announcements of nearly $100 million to grow the public interest technology ecosystem, uh, including programs from NSF, DOD, and private foundations. Uh, DOD is launching something called the Trusted Advisor Pilot, creating a, STEM, a pool of STEM and AI experts that can be tapped by agencies to support implementation of the AI executive order and other presidential priorities. We'll be knocking on doors seeking your participation in this program. I hope you'll sign up. It's gonna take all of us. The, the last thing I wanna touch on here is, you, you sort of may wonder why am I talking about all this stuff about public service? I think we can learn from law, from the, the, that, the field of law. Um, Many of you, many of us, engage in public service, but we need more than individual superheroes. We need a robust technical community interested in and financially able to spend time in public service careers. We've seen the benefits that accrue to society from professions that place a strong emphasis on the value of public service. Lawyers and the legal profession support service in government agencies and civil society organizations through things like uh, um, pro bono service. At the individual level, lawyers are expected to provide pre free legal services to those unable to pay or financial support to organizations that do so. Many law schools provide loan forgiveness programs that relieve academic debt of those choosing careers in public service. And many provide scholarships to incoming students who intend to practice public service law. 
law firms fund fellowships at civil society organizations. Careers in government and civil society organizations are viewed as normal, sometimes even noble choices. Lawyers frequently rotate in and out of government to provide their services and to learn how the other side thinks and works. Law firms have pro bono practice groups that serve both individuals and civil society organizations. There's a recognition that all members of the profession have a responsibility to serve the public and that public service careers are fulfilling and provide an opportunity to work on challenging and impactful technical issues. So unfortunately, we in the technical world are not the peers of our law, law uh, colleagues. We don't have the explicit commitment and institutional support for public service. Scientists and technologists, yeah, we're expected to engage in service through things like organizing conferences and journal editorial boards, service on government and military advisory boards, but there's no field or professional level commitment to public service and structures such as loan forgiveness that make careers in public service viable are absent. And so I'm asking you today to think as part of when you go back to your job, whether it's in academia or industry, to think about what you can be doing to uh, enhance uh, public service by technologists. I want to uh, uh, mention that some people think uh, public service, is, sometimes it gets a bad rap. Uh, there's a perception, sometimes intentionally fostered, that the U.S. government isn't capable of big technical wins, and that's just not true. The U.S. government has had big wins. The narrative that government can't solve technology problems undermines interest in working within government at a time when governments around the country and the globe cannot achieve their aspirations or fulfill their responsibilities without first-rate technical talent. So I'm happy to chat with anyone who's working to increase the value and opportunities of public service or is interested in doing so. And we're happy to chat with uh, people looking to grow the capacity needed in civil society organizations as well, organizations those organizations also need your talent and will benefit from the same actions. So let me conclude by noting that your vital partners, both on the technology side and the public service side, and the administration looks forward to working with all of you. Um, there it couldn't be a better time to work on topics like privacy at the intersection of computing law, regulation, and policy. And I look forward to working with all of you to make uh, all this happen. So I'm happy to take your questions. I will note that because of uh, EOP regulation, Executive Office of the President regulations, I cannot see the chat. So please don't put questions in the chat. Uh, raise your hand so I can see it, whether in person or in the Zoom. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, are there any questions in the room or online? One moment. I was I, I did a, an event yesterday where no one raised their hand, and so I said, "Well, I'm going to be a professor, and I'm going to call on you and ask uh, you questions <laughs> if you don't ask me questions." So I'm glad uh, someone in the audience is there. Uh, hi, Jeremy. This is uh, Christine Task, and um, hi, Christine. So, nice hi, to hear your going? voice. <laughs> uh, so um, the the big new uh, NSF effort, the ones due in September. Um, are there some sort of specific topics, outcomes, you know, in consideration of all the other groups you're you're looking at and all the other government needs and so on? Are there some some pain points you're hoping that the research for that will kind of help resolve or make progress so, on? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking about that. Uh, the PDAS solicitation. Um, does list a couple of specific areas. Unfortunately, I don't remember what they are, uh, but um, I don't want to speak for NSF beyond what the solicitation says. So what I would encourage you to do is to reach out to the NSF folks uh, with your idea. Um, I, I think we're really interested in getting the technology into use and less concerned about the specific uh, um, uh, 
problem that's being solved uh, with it. I think showing that pets can solve real world problems is the key goal of PDAS. And uh, so uh, it, whatever problem you want to solve, I think that'll be of interest. I can ask the same question slightly differently then. Okay. In going PDAS, um, from all the folks you talk to and all the things you've seen, um, are there problems that are especially interesting to you or that you see recur a lot as uh, oh. folks try to put things into practice? Um, that, that, that's a, a good question. And the, um, the group that I uh, mentioned, the, the government interagency group, it's, it's called the PETS sub-IPC, for those of you who are into government lingo, um, brings together people from, I think, 20, 25 different agencies. And everyone, uh, the number one problem everyone uh, has in using pets isn't a technical one. It's how to get uh, leadership support and how to get funding and things like that. And those are things we have to solve. You can't solve for us. Uh, but in terms of the technical areas, um, I think that there's a lot of interest in applying pets in medical settings. Uh, we have um, some projects ongoing that hopefully will be announced soon uh, for uh, th that will allow research to move forward in ways that it hasn't been able to move forward because it's too hard to share uh, data, medical data uh, in particular, um, both within the US and, and with other countries. Um, so I think that's a particularly important area because we, if you think about like the the Biden cancer moonshot, uh, there are things that could be advanced if we had better use of pets to allow more data sharing there. Hi, Jeremy. This is Salil. Um, <clears throat> So uh, you, just to interrupt you one second, Salil is one of the people who has spoken to uh, our working group, and thank you very much for doing that slide. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, you mentioned uh, towards the end of your talk uh, about the possibility of the government having big technical wins. And I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate, make that more concrete for us, either with or ideally both with the maybe a past example of what that looks like, uh, you know, and is it the government building something on its own or in some kind of, you know, partnership with academia or industry? And if you see maybe some relatively low hanging fruit where there may be an opportunity for that in pets or, you know, for this room, ideally differential privacy, but maybe more broadly pets. Well, um, I, I'm not sure how widely it's known uh, that the IRS has been working very closely with um, the Urban Institute uh, to use pets to allow uh, sharing of some tax data in privacy protected ways. And this is uh, going to enable um, research and understanding of um, where the ta uh, of tax data in many different uh, areas. And I, I don't know all the details of, of how they're doing it, but they have uh, pilot programs right now that are going on. Um, we all know about uh, census uh, has been using uh, differential privacy, uh, not without criticism to be sure, but uh, um, census has particular needs because they, by law, have to protect all the data they, they collect. They, um, there's very severe penalties for sharing uh, data collected as part of the census um, that isn't uh, properly protected. So I think there's, there's some big wins that government uh, has, has had with, with census, with IRS. Um, some of these medical things that hopefully you're about to get announced, uh, will, will be another one. Uh, um, um, yeah, I, th I think I'd, I'd want to, those unfortunately, uh, a lot of the projects uh, that have been successful aren't yet public. Great, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, any last questions? All right, Christine's got one more. And then we'll head to break after that. 
uh, things that are not yet public, but should be coming public soon. Where where can we all best watch to find out about them? Uh, can you get somebody to like post those <laughs> the OpenDP Slack for us or how can we stay in touch? Uh, that, that's that's a, a great uh, suggestion. Um, I think NIST will uh, publish some of the uh, uh, projects on their page because uh, they they have this site for their um, test bed and some of the new things that are coming out are, are going to be using um, that test bed. Uh, it is to be sure something that there isn't a great place uh, to um, find some of these things. Um, some of you are aware that as part of the AIEO, um, we uh, NSF and the Department of Energy funded something called the uh, Fu uh, Research Coordination Network, a future uh, run by the Future Privacy Forum, um, and that RCN and an RCN, if you're not familiar with that lingo, is um, a, a government-funded effort to bring together uh, people in a research area. Um, uh, to identify challenges and and needs, and that that RCN um, just start, started. We we had the kickoff meeting for that event at the White House in July, um, and I think they will be posting relevant stuff on on their web page as well. Um, and if you're interested in that RCN, I would encourage you to reach out to John Verdi uh, at the Future Privacy Forum um, to to understand what they're doing. They have an advisory board to identify research problems and to share uh, um, projects that become public. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for joining us and answering questions. If we can have another round of applause, please. Thank you for All the right. opportunity to join you. And, um, you know, I know there aren't as many of you there as there were either last night or a few weeks ago at their respective conventions, but I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about privacy. Anytime. <laughs> All right, we are moving into break. Uh, it's actually a transition break. There are some snacks outside, grab some coffee. We're heading back downstairs to the breakout sessions. Um, for those of you online, please refer to the agenda and join whichever Zoom meeting you would like to uh, attend for DP Beyond Algorithms, or you're gonna go to join the Open Research, oh, that, Open DP Research Challenges and Dev Directions. And we're gonna start that as soon as we get down there. <laughs> 